Welcome to Episode 3 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host for the show, and the president of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. On today's show, we have Sabinim Jake Daniele, a Taekwondo stylist from Freeport, Maine. I originally met Sabinim Jake at a tournament a little over a year ago, and I've come to really respect him. He's a great martial artist and an even better person. We had a nice chat about martial arts families, competition, and a lot more. Sabinim Jake is one of those people that has managed to thread martial arts throughout his life, and while teaching isn't his profession, he's managed to tie two other businesses to the martial arts. I hope you enjoy it. Sabinim Jake, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's it's great to have you here. You know, I'll admit, I don't know you really well, so this will be just as informational for me as for the listeners. So let's jump into the easy stuff. Uh, tell us a bit about your history with the martial arts. Yeah, I got started in Taekwondo when I was about five years old, so I'm 25 now, so I've been doing it about 20, 20 years. Um, I've trained in the same dojang since then. I started at Freeport Taekwondo, which is in Freeport or L.L. Bean, Maine. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a tourist, man, it's tough. But uh, my instructor was Master Jeff Wegley. He was really inspiring to me. I don't know, when I started, it just kind of clicked with me that this is what I should be doing. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a good ride. Cool. So you, you, know, you, you started at five. You've been in the same, not just the same style, but the same school. And even physical location for this whole 20 years? No, so like the physical location has only changed once, and it only changed after six months or so. Um, we actually train out of uh, a gymnasium. Um, it's nothing glamorous, but it, it works really well for us. It's, it's nice to have the additional space. I think a lot of dojos wish that they had more room, um, and so training in a gymnasium at least gives us that, which is which is great. Yeah, you know, I... I think a lot. There are a lot of martial arts schools that don't have their own owned space, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I grew up training in a community center gymnasium, and there were there was a ton of space. I think I remember some classes, you know, around karate camp and visiting groups coming in. We probably had forty to fifty people in there, and we had room to train with that. But then I've been with other schools and. You know, it was a struggle to get 20 people in the room with enough space. I agree. My, so. my favorite is like when you go to someplace else and, you know, you're all in this crammed environment. So you feel a little bit different, but, you know, you're sparring, you're just constantly bumping into people. And then when I take those same people back to mine and they just like are flabbergasted, they end up, if they're teaching a seminar or something, they use like a quarter of the gym because they're just not used to being able to, to move and spread out. So it's, I think it just changes because like everybody can do kata at the same time. Which is yeah, cool. yeah. Or to or to segment up the class and you know take a corner and have enough space in a corner to train ten people without stepping on each other's toes. The the dojang I train out of now is in the master's house, and if we get more than fifteen people in there, it gets really tight. <laughs> but we make it work. Yeah, that's right. Everybody right? everybody has their own struggles and and pros and cons and whatever, and it's just something you do with. That's right. Growing up, I was told we should be able to do all of our kata in a four-foot square. And I don't know if you've ever tried doing anything like that, but it's really tough. That's a lot of shuffling, I mean. (laughs) We're just kind of shortening your stances. I had one told me that I had a competition that was a guest instructor, and he said... Okay, you have to do your basic kata as quickly as possible. And he's like, I'm not even going to watch, so I'm not going to look at your stances. I'm not going to do any of that. And so if, if you do it that way, you can do it in you know five seconds and about uh, no stances. So I did that. Sure, before. sure. <laughs> that's a fun exercise. <laughs> that, you should, uh, everybody out there should try it. You know, that's one I haven't done. I, I've done I've done katas backwards, uh, oh. reversed blindfolded, trying to start facing a corner, all kinds of really weird ways, but I've never done it as fast as possible. So I will have to try that. Thank you. No problem. Tell us your best martial arts story. Um, 
Oh, so that's a toughie because I mean, it's been it's been a long time. I guess I'll start with a, a funny one. Well, I think it's funny. So the whole reason I got into martial arts was just because they were going to let me uh, give, have a uniform, and that was kind of my kick back then. <laughs> so I think you know it's funny because you look at like why why do people start or you know what what was the real driving measure? And it wasn't like the parents were like, oh, it's going to be a good thing for you. Like you're going to learn, um, you know, integrity and confidence and all of the the normal things that we as instructors kind of tout out there. But it was really just that I got to wear a cool uniform and, and that was uh, all it took for me. And I guess once I got there, then I started learning those things and and that was enough. But in terms Were there of, any other uniforms that you wore at that time? Oh, yeah. I mean, like between Cub Scouts or a baseball uniform or just, you know, soccer jersey, all that kind of stuff. Like I just my criteria for trying new things at that time was definitely uh, if it had a uniform and if I liked how it looked. <laughs> That's a new one. I can't say I've heard that before. Yeah. That's great. Um, but in terms of like a story that I, I normally tell people um, in terms of like my students and, and everything, cause I think. I'm trying to bring my kids to compete and and teach them the same lessons that I learned from the competition that I've done. And so I think one of the biggest problems or people get scared the most about is, well, what happens if I forget my kata and, you know, I freeze out in the middle or whatever. And so I, I would let them know that back when I was younger and I just got my junior black belt and at my school, there was no weapons. We're Taekwondo and it, it isn't a, uh, a prerequisite or a requirement for testing and my instructor never showed us that so I told him that you know I asked him if I could do it and if I could try and so I, I kind of taught myself bow just from what I had already seen on the competition circuit and everything and I ended up doing okay and you know I, I slowly got better and then one day I tied and when you're just teaching yourself and you only know one kata, that can be very intimidating. And so as a black belt, I couldn't go out and do the same kata. So I had to go out there and just completely freelance it, um, just kind of make it up <laughs> on the spot. And I had all of 30 seconds to decide what I was going to do from the time they told me I had tied and I was the first one to go. So wow. I always just, yeah, and I think this is more common now. I think some people can do this, but it wasn't, you know, when I was 12, it wasn't exactly uh, something I had ever considered that would happen. And, and I ended up winning, <laughs> which was crazy. <laughs> I was like, wow, maybe I should do this more often. Just winning the Yeah, time. maybe there was something to that. Um, so I always like to tell students that, like, you know, even if you don't know what happens next, you just kind of make it up and keep going. And, and you hope that all the judges don't know your kata, basically, so. You kind of know when you're done, when you're facing the right way. Yeah. You know? I think there's something to be said for that, for having enough of a, a foundation in martial arts to be able to flow things from one movement to the next and make it cohesive. And clearly you were able to do that, so that that's great. Uh, especially, you said you were 12? Uh, I was younger, yeah. I think I was 12 or 13. Yeah, so yeah. to be able to knock that out at a young age and and stay composed while doing that. That that says a lot to what kind of a 12, 13-year-old young man you are. So that's great. I think martial arts just helps in general for people, you know, build up confidence. And even if it's not a right. like form, it could be just, could be anything like that. You know, you're in school Absolutely. and make a debate or something. I couldn't have asked for a better segue to my next question. I don't know if you planned it that way, but thank you. What has the martial arts done for you? <laughs> well, there you go. It's given me confidence. And, yeah, I mean, I think it's that kind of thing that really helps. I mean, I did a, in college, I had a professor who said, I'm going to give you a no card, and it's going to say something, and you have to give a five-minute speech on that something, and I'll give you ten seconds to think about what you're going to do. And so what I just you know, my little story right there segued perfectly into that. It's like, okay, well, you know, I can make stuff up. Why not? Um, so just having the confidence that you know what you're doing emotionally to uh, physically obviously kept me in good shape. I think that the stretching twice a week, at least every, every week, 
for you know a couple of hours that's something I could count on and that kept me in good shape and helped me for other sports too great great yeah yeah dude. what other sports did you play uh, well once I got into high school I started I did uh, for like varsity sports I played tennis uh, and that was my main one I did alpine ski racing uh, which was a hoot and I, I tried a little bit of golf, but that that wasn't really my thing. <laughs> golf is not my thing either. Great. So, other than your your instructor, that's that's the one exception here. Name someone that was instrumental in your martial arts upbringing, and why? Well, you've taken off the easy one. Absolutely. I mean, I think that. When I'm instructing and I tell and I'm talking to my kids and the adults, but but mostly to the kids and you know especially the real younger ones, it's it's not always up to it's not me who's actually doing being that instrumental person. It, it's really their parents because their parents are the ones who bring them to martial arts. The parents are the one who thought it was a good idea, who are paying the money, and I think that. You know, so if I if I can't pick my instructor, you know, right up on that level, for me, it's my parents because both of my parents did martial arts with me, and so it became a family thing. And having both of them getting their black belts with me and then continuing to train for a long time, and, you know, it, it, I think that is really where I would go with that. I think that they were were definitely instrumental into getting me into martial arts, having me stay in martial arts, motivating me. Um, you know, they took me to competitions. They sacrificed, you know, their weekends, and so I would I would give a shout out to them. That's a great answer, and I I think I'd have to agree with you. You know, my my mother was instrumental. So you said you. You tested for your black belt with both of your parents? Yeah. So I oh. <laughs> I was in the second session ever of Freeport Taekwondo. Um, and so once my parents had seen what we were doing, because it started off as just for kids, you know, they kept asking, kept asking for an adult class. And eventually my instructor uh, gave in. And so, you know, they started a little bit later than I did, which is natural for an adult to go a little quicker than a kid. So... Sure. Um, but yeah, it was it was really cool when I there were five junior black belts when I tested, and there were maybe ten adult black belts, and all five of us kids had at least one parent testing for black belts at the same time. There was not one young kid who didn't have an adult. Oh, that's that's really neat. So is that that kind of is that an exception or is that fairly common? In your school? At my school, I think that's actually really common. I think it, it took a long time for us to get a junior black belt who was alone. And honestly, I think we've only had three or four come through who are really alone and really, and then, you know, but if once they got their black belt or were just about to test, then maybe their, uh, their parent had started by that point. So you know, really, it's only like one or two kids that were like really alone when they were there, and and I don't know if that's just our teaching style or how that happened, but for some reason, yeah, that's that's what ends that's, up going down. That's pretty interesting. So, you know, as I listen to that, I know there are a lot of martial arts schools out there that almost covet having the whole family they do family rates uh family classes you know with with broader age groups because they recognize that if a family's training together they're more likely to all stick around and whether your goal as a martial arts school is to make money to spread your art or both having the entire family there or more of the family than just one member helps that goal so is there something that that you're aware of that you guys do that other martial arts instructors and school owners might learn from i don't think there's any any kind of secret sauce i think for us one of the reasons is 
is that if your parent is involved, then your the child is allowed to come to more classes without an additional cost. So like if we're teaching an adult class, we understand that sometimes like, you know, what are you going to do with your child? So we say that as long as they're well behaved and can listen, that they are welcome. You know, we don't, you know, you're not a five-year-old white belt yet, but as long as they're focused, they can come and they won't get the same attention they get in the kids class, but it gives them something to do and it gives them extra practice, which I think in turn builds on itself because then the kid enjoys it more. Um, they get to learn more in the adult class if they're really paying attention, I think, because it's, you know, not as game oriented, which I guess can be good or bad. But uh, I think that's, that's one of the, the reasons it's happened so often at our school. It's, it's just uh, the extra class time and the families say, oh, well, you know, double the training time for, for little Johnny and I get to go now. So this is great. So you're taking out that one of, if not the biggest objection to getting parents into martial arts, which is what do you do with the kids? Right. You know, that the quote unquote daycare question. And I've seen some schools that offer a separate daycare program simultaneously or they run the classes separately, but at the same time. But you're saying as long as they're competent enough to follow along and not. I'm going to guess be a distraction. Right, as long as they're not to the adults, they're welcome. Exactly, um, and, and it's worked really well. I think that you know you definitely don't get the attention. Like, don't get me wrong, the kid is not going to learn. Is not going to get that direct feedback like they get in the in the young classes. But it also shows the young kids like, oh, that's what the black belts or that's what the the green belt adults are doing, and I'm a green belt. How come I don't look like that? Oh, maybe it's because they're doing these things. Um, so I think that helps as well. So there's, so there's the motivational element. Oh yeah. Which, would you would you say that there's a correlation between the kids that come to those extra classes, those adult classes, and the rate of their progress? Absolutely. I think any time that you get to train twice as much, you know, that's that's the deciding factor. And and the same thing with here. I'll, I'll try and segue. But it's the same thing that. Uh, happens in competition, really. I think the kids that from your dojo that go to competition, because they're getting that extra practice and that extra exposure, they're the ones who end up flourishing quicker than students who just stay at the dojo and go to their one or two classes a week. You know, the more, just the more time you get, the more infectious it is, and then the more you want to work hard and kind of balloons from there. That, that makes sense. Um, so let's talk a little bit about competition. You, you mentioned, um, one of the, the, maybe a, a, a rough patch, but with a happy ending in competition with making up your no. form on the spot. <laughs> Have you done a lot of competition? Is that big in your school? Yeah. I mean, we definitely push the competition. We, our school holds the karate tournament in September in Freeport every year. Um, and we're a part of the Pone, which is the New England rating system, as well as Smart, which is the main rating system. And so I, I grew up with competition. It was always a part of my school. And I think that it exposes you to other styles, other influential people. You know, if you talk, when we're talking about the influential people, I think right after your instructor and your parents are the people that you compete against and their instructors, and you're learning from them almost in the same way. You just don't get to see them as often. And for me, competition has become more of like a, a family atmosphere. You know, I look forward to going and seeing my friends that I grew up with um, and who are still competing today, as well as the instructors who've taught me a lot of from different styles. So I'm, I'm a big fan of competition. Do you have a favorite event? Ooh, uh... Are you a fighter? Are you a forms guy? Oh, I thought you meant like a breaking. I thought you meant no, no. I wasn't going to ask you to pick a tournament that was, yeah, that was your favorite. That that would be that would be mean, especially since uh, hopefully anyway, a lot of the tournament promoters are going to be listening to this. Don't want to offend anyone. No, no, no. Are you are you a kata guy? Are you a fighter? 
breaker. When I was when I was younger, I was always a kata guy, but I think now I'm I'm definitely more of a fighter, and I I do point sparring mm-hmm. to put it out there, but uh, that's definitely what I'm more known for. Now you mentioned that your your school puts on a tournament, and you know um, Whistle Kick was there last year, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about your event when we get to the the point at the end where you get to promote your stuff, but um, is that day in September always the hottest day of the summer? <laughs> I mean, it always seems that way lately. Uh... Because for for the listener, um, this was m- early September, right? It's always the, yeah, summer? it's the first weekend after Labor Day. Okay. So early to mid September, 2014, and it was 90 degrees outside that day. It was it was by far the hottest day that I, I remember and it was muggy and I just I don't know how hot it was in that gymnasium but thank you very much for n- not setting the whistle kick booth up in the gymnasium putting us out in the hallway because as long as anybody wasn't competing or watching someone compete they were out in the hallway because it was 20 degrees cooler and uh, got a lot of foot traffic because of that so thank you the way we planned it <laughs> well um it doesn't have to be quite so hot next year, but if that's the way you want to do it, I'll, I'll take it. No, no. I'll, I'll call the weatherman and, and tell him what to do. Good. Good. Somebody's, somebody's got to have control over that. If you could train with any martial artist, living or dead, who would it be and why? That's a, that's a good one. I mean, I think for me, I would look at any founder of a style and just think that that would just blow my mind. So like Funakashi for Shotokan or or Dr. Kano for Judo, that would be really cool. I, I guess I could only pick one. I think I'd go with the founder of Judo just because with Taekwondo, it's a very stand-up style. Um, lots of kicking, obviously. And so just seeing something completely different and seeing, you know, the master in that would be, would be really cool. Have you done any judo or jujitsu? I haven't. Um, I mean, I've, I've rolled a couple of times, you know, just in passing, but I've never like actually trained for months on end. You know, I mean, I think one of the most fun things to do is to go see other schools and just see how they do things. Um, but I've been training at the same place for for my whole martial arts career. And so, you know, I don't want to give that up, but I also, I I go more on like small excursions and and go try something just for a couple of classes. As as I think you should. I, I've always had this theory that your martial arts training is kind of like the, the wheel in trivial pursuit. You've played trivial pursuit, right? And you get the little wedges, and the first style that you train in is the biggest wedge. And then as you train in other things, you're adding more wedges. And you never fill your, your pie, your circle, but you're, you're always looking. And, it's, and it kind of reminded me of that. In, you're kind of saying that, you know, you've always done taekwondo, but to do something grappling, more ground-oriented, would, be, would add a lot to your pie. Exactly. Because you haven't haven't done really done much so that's that's really cool and i i would encourage everyone out there listening not you know it doesn't mean that you give up what you're training now but to experiment with other styles other instructors i was lucky that i i've always trained at schools where the instructors were open to sharing and i think that's a pretty important part of the martial arts definitely do you do you have a favorite martial arts film? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a big fan of Jackie Chan, so I think I'd have to go yeah. go his way. And, uh, you know, one that really didn't get a lot of hype because it was, I don't know why, but it was uh, The Forbidden Kingdom with him and Jet Li. Wow, it was yeah. just the coolest thing. And That was a great movie. I feel like I'm the only one, but it's, it's nice to know that. No. Did you spend the the whole 
what was it, like first hour, hour and 15 minutes waiting for them to fight? Yeah, I was just like, just skip to that part. And then I could watch <laughs> that's, it. That's what I was sitting there waiting for. Come on. That was a great fight scene. Back in high school, um, two, two of my best friends trained in karate with me. And we would um, we would drive in to Portland to the big theater. So um, for listeners that maybe haven't picked this up from previous episodes, I grew up in Maine, not too far from where uh, we're, we're talking about Freeport. So we'd drive into Portland and we'd watch, you know, whatever the latest Jackie Chan movie was. What was it? Rumble in the Bronx and then Super Cop. And there was another one in there. And I forget which one it was, but we were the only three people in the theater. So we're watching the movie on the on the big screen and we're sparring. Of course. <laughs> at the same time. And and we're watching. Oh, what did he just do? Oh, let's try that. So um, I, I'm surprised we weren't thrown out. I'm sure the projectionist thought some pretty strange things of us, but we had a blast. It was a good time. That sounds epic. <laughs> it was. So... I assume Jackie Chan would be your your favorite martial arts actor. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely stick with him. I think just the humor he puts into it, um, the expressions and everything that you know, and he's got real good skills too. So don't you know? Don't get me wrong. I think that's that's the direction I'd go. He does. Any man that does his own stunts, and for what is it? The upcoming. Summer Olympics that's in the bidding process right now. He recorded a song. Really? For China? Yeah, yeah. Part of the the bid package that they've submitted to the International Olympic Committee had a song from Jackie Chan. Uh, and apparently he did that last time too when they got what was it Beijing when they got the Beijing Olympics. Oh, so like good luck for them. Apparently. <laughs> How about books? Any martial arts related books that you're fond of? Um. Yeah, I think I read one. It's called Family Power. Being a Taekwondo guy, that one was really interesting to me because it follows the Lopez family. I think it's the Lopez family. Um, and it was for the 2008, so the Beijing Olympics, I think. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and not only did they have, so like each country submit two fighters, two guys and two girls, I think. Sounds right. And... They, two of their brothers were the guys, and their sister was one of the girls. So three out of the four were this from this one family, and then the coach was the oldest brother. So like they sent the whole family over there, basically. Um, and so just you know, hearing about how they trained, and like they have a dojo in the back of their house, and um, just kind of their their experience with it all, and it, it was just really interesting. So if you, Sounds like that resonated pretty strongly for you with the the strong family ties at your school. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, if I had to pick another one, one I read recently was called Falling Hard, uh, and it's all about judo and the history of judo. Um, so I would think it's by Mark Law, maybe. Okay. Um, for people out there, that was a good book. I'd recommend. Well, I'll look these up, and those will be in the show notes. So we'll just throw some links in there, make it easy for people. Cool. Yeah, I haven't read either of those. Um, Come on. <laughs> I'll give you the book next time I see you. <laughs> All right. That that sounds good. And you can uh, tell everybody if they're worth it or not. I'm, I'm going to, you know, now now that we're doing this podcast, I'm getting book recommendations. All the time. And, of course, nobody's doing the same ones, which is makes for good content if everyone was coming on. Offering the same books and the same movies might make for a poor interview, but all it's doing is making my book list pretty darn long. So <laughs> I'll have to, I don't know, start skipping interviews and reading. You just need to read a, a book a day or whatever. <laughs> just a book a day? Come on. I don't have anything else to do. No boxes of sparring gear to send out today. Oh, yeah. This book can wait. This is more important. And our last question, and hopefully hopefully a good one to end on, how about any martial arts-related goals you might have for the future? Well, I mean, in the... I guess you, you categorize this into a short term and a long term. Okay. In the short term, 
I actually think it'd be really cool to learn the, the echo, or I don't, I don't I might not be saying it right, but the, the or. Um, oh, okay. Weapons has always been kind of a, just an interest in mine, again, because it's not something that is really prevalent at my school, but I, I try to bring it in when I can, and um, not that the or is Taekwondo or anything, but it's just something that I've been really interested in lately, so I, I think in the short term I would like to to learn a little bit more about that and just expand my horizon a little. Um, but for the long term, I think owning my own school is, is definitely high on my list. I'm one of the instructors at Freeport, uh, one of the head instructors, but having a school that is mine would be really, would be really cool. Maybe with an actual location. <laughs> so that way I can hang things on the wall. Cause that, that's the only downside I tell you of being in a gymnasium is you got a large sparring gear. I mean, uh, pads and anything you want in the gym you got to lug it in and out so one one of the taekwondo schools in in my area actually the the man who runs it uh master lenihan who who i'm hoping to have on the show at some point in the future trains under my instructor master rota and he operates his dojang out of the basement of the local masonic lodge and so he's got the same thing where he's got to lug stuff in and tradition in our schools is to hang the Korean and the American flag at the head of the room. And of course he can't do that. Not only can he not hang things there, but even if he wanted to, there's a stage up front and a a curtain, so there's really nowhere to hang anything. So his solution was to get a couple desk-sized flags in the little uh, (laughs) little, uh, bases, you know, so when when we bow in at the beginning of class, the little you know two by three flags at the front of the room. That's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, weapons are fun. I, I always enjoyed weapons. Um, if you ever want to learn Psy, I could help you with that. That's that's the one that I know the best. Yeah, I might take you up on that. Cool. Well, bring some Psy to the next tournament, and I'll I'll show you some stuff. When's Whistle Kick gonna start selling Psy? That's uh, when's the expansion? Let's go. <laughs> Whistle Kick will sell Psy when we can m- offer something better than what's out there. Yeah. And that that's kind of, you know, not that we get too deep into the business end of Whistle Kick on this podcast, um, but that's anything that, that we're going to do, we're going to be able to do better. I don't want to just, I don't want us just turning out Me Too products. You know, anybody can can take sparring gear and throw their logo on it. Right. You know, and there are a lot of companies out there that do that, and that's why we did what we did. You know, that's why we did it, did sparring gear first, because we felt that was the place we could make the most impact. So when we can have some kind of either ultra high quality psi or maybe in a, a really cool, you know, artistic angle, you know, somebody manufacturing something in the states where we could say. This guy made this. Right. You know, then we might do that. That'd be cool. Yeah, it'd be fun. So now's time to promote yourself. Would maybe tell us more about this event that, that you guys run in September or anything else you want to pitch? Sure. So I'll just say it again the, the Pine Tree State Karate Championship. Uh, again, the first weekend of September, first weekend after Labor Day in September. Uh, it's a good time. Again, we are New England rated and Maine rated. Um, so yeah, that's that. And then uh, my side business, or one of them, if I have multiple, <laughs> is uh, be called Because Sensei Says. And what we do is a unique martial art t-shirt every week. Uh, so it's on a rotating scale. So every Thursday night is the last time to get it. And then Friday is a new t-shirt. And that t-shirt that ended on Thursday is gone forever or until we get enough people saying they really want it to come back and maybe we'll bring it back. But for the most part, it's gone forever. So that's kind of uh, my promotional bid for that. Go to BecauseSenseiSays.com and uh, check it out. And I think it's great. You guys have come up with some, some really cool shirts, and I'm starting to see them on the tournament circuit, people popping up with them. And the designs are really neat and a lot of fun. I think you're bringing a bit of uh, humor and, and 
with some some novelty there on the shirts, and I think that that's definitely missing. I think often as martial artists, we get a little bit too serious sometimes. Yeah, I think. I mean, I was just getting tired of seeing the same ones from either AWMA or or wherever you your supplier. You know, I feel like the the designs haven't changed in the last twenty years. Um, so yeah, I was just trying to do something different, give a little, like you said, humor to it. I think it's. Uh, try to do something that people can be proud of you know it's, even if you're not with a group of martial artists it's kind of cool to say yeah i'm a martial artist and here's what i think kind of show it off uh, absolutely and don't you guys do something where if someone submits a design that you accept they they get something for that did i read that on your website yeah so that's what, something we're trying to to get into is, is the idea of if you have an idea for something that you think would really cool on a shirt, uh, you can just email us. Our email is right on the website, and or call, or however you want to get in touch with us. We're on Facebook, too. And if we like your design idea, we'll make it, and we'll send you a shirt for free. It's better, it's better than that. Yeah, so if you, if you have a good idea that we haven't done yet, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Well, I'm sure there are a bunch of listeners out there that have some great ideas, and they don't have to do anything more than than develop the idea. You'll take care of all the rest. Yeah, and if you want to print it too, that's you know that's great. <laughs> we can work out a deal. But yeah, if you just all we need to know is what you think. Love your cool. opinion. Love that. So my other business is called mainly engraving, but uh, what we do is I've gotten into the trophy business a lot, and so I do custom awards and. I work a lot with the New England circuit for their awards, either for the banquet or individual tournaments, and I, I really like to come up with unique martial art trophies. I'm happy to do trophies and everything, but one of my favorite, like what we did for, for my tournament last year, if I shouldn't tell my own tournament, but is we made wood. You absolutely should. <laughs> is we made wooden medals um, that had the name of the tournament, our kicker guy logo, and it was all routed in. Um, and so making, I've made ones uh, for other tournaments where it looks like a scroll made out of wood um, with their event on it. So I really like making unique things, particularly out of wood, I guess, um, just to give people a taste of something different. That's great. And, you know, the one that I think resonates for me the most that, that you guys did, not that the medals weren't fantastic because they absolutely were and the, the kids definitely loved wearing them around their neck was what you did um for Sheehan Campbell with the shirts you want to talk, talk about that real quick sure so because Sensei says we had a, a tournament approach us and he wanted to do t-shirts for all of his awards and it, it turned out really great people really liked it they Kata had a different logo, and Kumite, then Weapons, um, and so depending on what you won, you came up, you got your size, um, so we were making the t-shirts right there on a heat press, uh, and, and people loved it. They even actually still sold tournament t-shirts at the event, and those still sold too, so it, uh, it, was just not, it was just nice to do something different, and I think that resonates well with people. Absolutely. So if if listeners out there want to get in touch for some creative awards or check out the Because Sensei Says shirts, we're going to have all that stuff linked. Um, and do you have a direct website or link for your tournament? Or should or would, we can just link back to the opponent Smart? Yeah, link to the Smart page. Okay. Um, there's always more we can work on. So, yeah, having a, a nice website is, is on the docket. That's, that's, on, that's on the plan. Great. All right. Well, I think that that about does it. Summon him, Jake. Thank you so much for being here on Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I had a lot of fun talking to you. Thanks for having me. It was great. All right. And, and I'm sure I'll see you soon. <laughs> At the next tournament, you bet. Thank you for listening to this episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I want to thank Summon him, Jake Danielli, for coming on and talking to me. You can always check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you'd like to learn more about what we offer at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, please check us out on the web at whistlekick.com or find us on Facebook. Have a great day.